Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Julian Siggers, and I have good fortune to be the Williams Director of the Penn Museum. So, as you all know, today we are 125, and thank you so much for coming to celebrate with us. The Douglas G. Lowell Annual Reports from the Field Lecture Series is the result of a very generous anonymous gift in honor of the, day, the late Douglas Lowell, who served on the museum's board for many years. His widow, Alida, is with us tonight, and we're very grateful to have her here. This evening's speakers are all current Kolb Junior Fellows, supported by funding from the Lewis J. Kolb Foundation, which was established in 1981 through a bequest by Catherine Kolb Panaker in honor of her father, Colonel Lewis J. Kolb. I'm going to, there are five of them, so this, we haven't done this before, um, but I think it's quite rather an interesting way to have a really good picture of some of the amazing research that's being done here through the museum and obviously through the university. So our first speaker tonight, and they've only got an hour, and they know that. Um, our first speaker tonight is Daria Nochia, a third year student in art and archeology span in the Mediterranean World Graduate Group. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Pisa and completed a graduate program in classical archeology span at the University of Genoa. Her research interests include Roman imperial architecture, topography, frontier boundary issues, the techniques and methodologies of ex excavation and computer applications and material culture with a special focus on the amphora trade and economy. She will speak tonight on excavations at the Villa of Emperor Maxentius in Rome. Our second speaker is Jordan Pickett, a six year student in art and archeology span of the Mediterranean World Graduate Group. He received his bachelor's degree in the history of art, religious studies, and medieval studies from Indiana University. His dissertation is on Rome hydraulic infrastructure in the Eastern Mediterranean, and it is a comparative study exploring the diverse afterlives of Roman baths and hydraulic architecture across the Mediterranean in the early Middle Ages from the perspectives of Byzantium and the Caliphate. His topic this evening is temples, churches, and systems late antique water management at Jerash, Jordan. Another third year student of art and archeology span in the Mediterranean World Program is Stephen Rene. And Stephen holds a master's degree from Ghent University and completed a further two years master's research at the program at Leiden University. He has excavated in Belgium, Tunisia, Corsica, Syria, and Azerbaijan and plans a dig this year at a new site in Iraqi Kurdistan, which is actually breaking some new and very interesting territory. This evening, he will speak on Konichai and the Bayesian Valley Archaeological Project, new field work in an unexplored region of Iraqi Kurdistan. Our penultimate speaker is Tiffany Hain, and she's a first year graduate student in the anthropology department. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Stanford University, where her work centered on Western Australia's canning stock route and the complexities of reconciling conflicting notions of value, significance, and identity in the region. She will speak tonight on modes of reconciliation, art and archeology span in Australia's Western desert. And our final speaker is Joanne Brown, a seventh year doctoral student in the anthropology department from which she has received her bachelor's degree. Since 2008, she has been actively working at La Corona, a classical Maya period site in Northwest Guatemala. Her work focuses on the small series of temples that belong to the site's patron gods, which unusually have hieroglyphics, identifying the patron gods associated with each temple. And her dissertation discusses the ways these gods were worshiped and their importance in the creation of community, identity, and autonomy. Her lecture this evening is entitled Patron Gods of the Maya. So I am very pleased to give the podiums up to Daria Nochia, our first speaker. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see such a nice crowd. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about an excavation project that I've been part of for four years. Uh, the project is directed by Professor Diane Conlin uh, from the University of Boulder, Colorado, and Dr. Gianni Ponti in Rome. And I'd like to um, take this occasion to thank the Salvatore Research uh, Grant, the Penn Museum, and the Amway Department, who allowed me to participate in this project in the summer of 2011 and 2010. Um, the site is located in the southern uh, part of Rome and along the Appian Way. It's one of the most, uh, one of the best preserved archaeological sites in Rome, as you can see from this aerial picture, which uh, shows uh, the amazing preservation of the circus. Over here, the uh, so-called tomb of Romulus over here. And in this area here, in this nice greenery, there are the traces of the imperial palaces that Emperor Maxentius built uh, in his very brief reign between 306 and 312 AD. Uh, in these photos, you can appreciate the extension of the conservation of the site uh, uh, as far as elevation is uh, concerned. You can see here the remains of the circus, and here the remains of an apse from one of the most uh, um, important uh, areas of the palace, a basilical hall which has been interpreted as a representative space. Uh, the site is particularly important because it entails, uh, it entails further understanding on the role of Emperor Max oh, sorry, of the role of Emperor Maxentius, which has been the subject of the most recent scholarship. As a matter of fact, the more archaeological research uh, we do in Rome, the more traces we find about uh, interventions, restorations, or new buildings that the Emperor Maxentius built. You may be more familiar with his rival, which is Emperor Constantine. Uh, they met in this very famous battle at the Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. And according to this uh, Latin panegyricus, a speech that was delivered in 312 AD on the occasion of the battle, it is uh, stated that Emperor Maxentius, two days before the battle, moved out the Imperial Palace from, from the core of the city and uh, retreated to a private house. Most of scholars believe that the private house that is referred to here is his palace uh, on the Appian Way, which is the uh, site that I've been working on for the past four years. What I'm showing you here is the map that was produced in 1976 in the first real systematic ex excavation of the site led by Giuseppina Pisani Sartorio, who was uh, a pioneer female archaeologist in Italy, she did an amazing job uh, as far as uh, maps and plans and drawings are concerned. However, in 1976, archaeological excavations in Italy were not carried out according to modern scientific methods. So what she did, she, ba she basically chased uh, the walls, especially in this area, uh, digging very deep trenches uh, all along the walls uh, in order to um, dig out as much uh, as she could of the walls. So that actually caused uh, some methodological problems uh, uh, because we have lost lots of data regarding the stratigraphy, which is uh, what we do today in uh, modern scientific archaeological excavation. So when the new project uh, took over, we focused on this area here. What you see here is this uh, rectangular room with an apse at the end, which has been interpreted as a basilica hall, so basically a representative space where the emperor would receive uh, uh, people uh, for representative reasons. And the palace is joined here by the circus. It's a very complex structure which occupied a site where previous spaces have been identified. As a matter of fact, the site was occupied by a Republican villa and uh, an Hadrianic villa from the second century AD, which belonged to uh, Herod Atticus, which was a Greek man who basically married Annie Regilla, which was a member of the wo one of the most uh, uh, important aristocratic families in Rome. They owned the whole estate and basically um, they built above the Republican villa, a Rep an Adrianic villa whose remains uh, have been discovered 
in the 976 excavation and in our own excavation. We focused on this area here. This is 2008, 2009, the beginning of season. And uh, it's been difficult for us to find uh, uh, the most appropriate site uh, to continue the excavation because the site is really big and some areas of the site uh, belong to private estates. So this actually caused a problem and we had to decide which area we wanted to focus on. And we decided to focus on that area here, the site of the Basilica Hall. And what we found, uh, uh, apart from a, a huge amount of painted frescoes and mortar, which allowed us to reconstruct the decorative pattern of the Hadrianic Villa, the most important data that we were able to gather regards the relation between the Hadrianic Villa and the Imperial Palace. Uh, it was very remarkable for us to find in here part of a colonnaded portico which belongs to the Hadrianic Villa still in its original position. So what you see here are traces of the columns, brick columns, which were covered by painted mortar and some of these columns still bear traces of the color. This was a, a very remarkable find uh, and it allowed us to comprehend much more clearly the relationship between the Hadrianic Villa and the Imperial Palace. And I'll tell you later what the relationship is. Uh, this is the end of 2009 season. In uh, the summer of 2010, um, uh, we, for lack of funding, we didn't carry out any excavation. And this was the situation in 2011, unfortunately. This is the photo that I personally took exactly in the same spot. Uh, if any of you ever worked in Italy, you know that sometimes it takes some time to get things done. So a few days after, the municipality of Rome, we convinced the municipality of Rome to clear the site and we were able to expand our trench north here because we really wanted to uh, find other traces of the colonnaded portico. Uh, that was uh, our uh, last season of, ex of excavation. What we were able to find, thanks to the great help of the students from the University of Colorado, which are now uh, in these photos, they are amused uh, at this uh, tree uh, being removed from the site. Uh, the, the, the last summer of excavation, uh, this, th this is the whole technology we had at our disposal. So basically we did all of measurements and all drawings by hand, the old fashioned way, still very precise, I trust me. And uh, <laughs> Uh, the most important uh, set of data that we were able to gather has to do with the construction techniques, uh, uh, abandonment phases, we were able, which we were able to identify very clearly and confirmed previous hypotheses that uh, uh, had just been suggested before. For, uh, as a matter of fact, what I'm showing you here is a detail about the relationship between the Imperial Palace and the Villa. Basically, in blue, you see the level, the walking level of the Imperial Palace, and in red, this is the walking level of the Hadrianic Villa. The Hadrianic Villa belongs to the second century AD, and the palace belongs to the fourth century AD. So you would expect that this level would be lower than the other one. Uh, this is just one of the many uh, uh, sets of data that confirm that, that the building of the Imperial Palace by Emperor Maxentius was actually unfinished. This is an unfinished project. We were also able to establish that the palace never received a proper flooring. And uh, this should not surprise us because Emperor Maxentius ruled over Rome only for six years, from 306 till 312. Still, he was responsible for a major building program and uh, uh, it, it, it there are so many uh, areas of Rome where we, we are able to see uh, his intervention. Um, now, the, as, I, as I already mentioned, this, the, the, the excavation season is closed. The, the, the summer of 2011 was the last one. We are now working on the publication of the result. I am personally working on the reconstruction of the Basilica Hall here. As you can see, this is the situation of the apse as it is preserved today. But as you can appreciate from this drawing from 1948, 1818, 18, there is uh, much that's being uh, collapsed. As a matter of fact, right now, uh, 
some restoration work has been carried out on the apps. And um, in an independent study that I took in the fall of uh, 2011 here at Penn with Professor Hasselberger, we started the reconstruction of, of the whole building, which will be part of the final publication. So this is a, an extremely significant archaeological site which shed an important light of, in our understanding of the role of Emperor Maxentius in Rome. I've been very lucky to participate in this and I look forward to the publication of the results. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight uh, to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the University Museum and to have the opportunity to present with you some of the results of my field work uh, from this last summer in Jerash, Jordan, uh, which uh, was only possible uh, with the generous support of uh, the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman, uh, the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Amway Group, and the Kolb Foundation. So uh, thank you. Um, recently published high resolution climate proxy evidence uh, from cores of stalagmites in the Sorek Caves of Israel, which give us uh, an indication of annual rainfall in millimeters uh, by year, extending over the last 2,000 years, indicates that the weather in the late antique Eastern Mediterranean became considerably more instable and arid after about 100 AD, reaching a trough of annual precipitation in the sixth century, right around here, uh, which you can see, uh, which ameliorated somewhat and improved, stabilized somewhat only after the early 10th century. This put new stress on cities in late antiquity, just as urban and hinterland populations surged, cultural and religious horizons shifted, and the Hellenistic Roman model of autonomous city government was transformed. At Jerash, uh, an ancient city in northern Jordan, I wanted to explore and document the ways in which the architecture and the built environment of the city responded to changing climates and cultural attitudes about water, and especially water scarcity, taking a long view from the first to the ninth centuries AD. So how did the physical infrastructure of water supply and distribution and consumption and drainage change in Jerash during this period? In the mid second century AD, a municipally organized system of long distance water supply and management was introduced as part of a larger program of urban renewal that organized and upgraded the city's streets here in red and that surrounded the city with walls and gates. This new water system interacted with rain runoff primarily for the purposes of drainage. Drinking water was led from the Berkatain Spring four kilometers to the north of the city into pipes that fed the new west bath, which you can see here, and a line of fountains that punctuated the length of the Cardo. The Cardo fountains functioned at least until the mid seventh century, but they were also altered in late antiquity so as to economize on water consumption, namely by contracting the volumes of fountain basins and by introducing secondary supply lines at much lower uh, levels than the original configuration. So for example, here in Fountain 7, which is located on the west side of the Cardo, just uh, a few meters south of a fifth century cathedral complex, we can see that the dimensions of the fountain were changed. So originally this was the back surface of the fountain and then there was a second basin that was introduced that brought the back wall forwards by about 50 centimeters. And this had the effect of making less water available for consumers as it contracted the volume of the basin by nearly half uh, from about three cubic meters to something less than two. Uh, an alternative su water supply was also introduced. Originally, water was discharged into the fountain through sculpted lion's heads, which you can see right here at the top of the fountain apparatus. But later, a rectangular uh, channel for a 20 centimeter drainage pipe, or uh, supply pipe rather, uh, was introduced, uh, cut into the base of the third sidewalk step about one and a half meters below this original level. So from here down to here, you can see right behind the meter step. Um, 
This is related either to the introduction of a totally new supply line for the city in the fifth century or to a lack of pressure in the original supply line, which would have required either raising the elevation of the supply or dropping the level, uh, the elevation of the outflows as precisely here and also in several other fountains. Uh, besides the Birkatain water main coming from the north, work this summer also documented for the first time another water supply line that entered the city from the west and which fed large vaulted reservoirs under the Temple of Artemis platform, at least in its original incarnation. As planned in the second century, drainage on the temple platform was achieved by channeling water from drains or graded pavement surfaces into sewers at the east and south portal where excavations in the 1930s revealed a large masonry drain of well-cut ashlars. After the fifth century, all this changed, and you are forgiven for being overwhelmed by the next slide. <coughs> uh, so water conduits here are in orange, and uh, places of water storage are in purple, so that gives you some idea. Um, and this all changed as the Roman obsession with drainage became a Byzantine and an Umayyad obsession with water storage. The Artemis temple and its porticos began to be despoiled. Its columns and capitals, and especially its cobblestone pavers, were carried off to be reused in the construction of new churches. Removing the pavers had a dramatic effect. It exposed the soft, marly bedrock under the pavers, and in doing so, facilitated the creation of new rock-cut channels, pipe housings, and reservoirs that were cut into the soft rock below the temple. New pipes and channels led across the temple platform before crossing under and over the temple stylobate at the edges of the platform. So you can see these pipes here that cross uh, just over uh, the threshold of the temple platform and which run across the temple uh, platform in front of the temple itself. <coughs> These new arrangements for the provision of water benefited the temple's neighbors near the cathedral and the church of St. Theodore, and they supplied cisterns, a public fountain, a bath, shops, and small-scale industry, as well as an elaborate water-powered stone saw, which is the oldest machine in the world to have been reconstructed. On the temple platform itself, a network of cut and cover channels reveal the introduction of a new spring-fed pipeline from the city's north. Water trickled down a cut and cover channel in front of the temple podium steps, uh, which you can see here just in front of the steps and coming from the north uh, to the steps which are right here. Um, let's, uh, so it's, uh, yes, trickled in front of the temple podium steps into a Roman ossuary, uh, which is right here that was reused as a diviculum or a distribution box where flows were divided into uh, three uh, separate pipelines. Uh, so a large rock cut reservoir at the southwest, which you can see here, a series of pipes that fed a bath and a sawmill ne near the temple's southeast corner flowing out in this direction, and three, an, an additional series of pipes that exited the platform at the temple's south portal heading toward the neighborhood that sprang up uh, here around the Church of St. Theodore after the fifth century. From the southeast corner of the temple platform, water was directed into two cut and cover channels that fed a large reservoir, about 90,000 liters, on the intermediate terrace. Now, an overflow channel in this reservoir, which you can see here, in turn supplied the overshot water mill that powered this uh, remarkable stone saw. This means that the reservoir must have been quite full in order for the saw to function, and therefore that the mill was not the reservoir's primary recipient. Another set of pipes crossed south over the temple stylobate and supplied the fountain uh, that was in the cathedral atrium, uh, where Epiphanius in the late fourth century said that he had witnessed a festival for the miracle of Cana uh, when Christ turned water into wine. Uh, as well as these pipes also supplied the placus baths, which are uh, right in this vicinity. Uh, in its last phase, the reservoir supplying these baths, which you can see here, was also reconfigured so as to function only with overflow and its volume was nearly halved. Water discharged by the bath and sawmill was flushed out of a large stone discharge channel uh, that bent hard to the south, so we can follow it from the sawmill here as it bent hard to the south 
running alongside stairs by the placus baths east side and down into the fountain court uh, where it finally, it ran along the north side of the cathedral to finally discharge uh, in a, uh, out onto the cardo on the main street. Uh, so the sawmill, the placus bath, the cathedral and the cardo are all connected together by the water system in this fashion, right? So let's conclude by looking quickly at the neighborhood west of the St. Theodore complex near the Artemis Temple Southern Portal, which was excavated by Clarence Fisher, formerly of the University of Pennsylvania, just a few years after he had been fired from his job as director of the University Museum's Beth Shawn excavations. This is a fascinating story uh, that is told in an upcoming special edition of Expedition Magazine, published by the University Museum, which is dedicated to Beth Shawn, and it should appear this spring, so I encourage you all to look for that. Fisher found that the drain at the temple's southern portal had been reconfigured as a supply channel in late antiquity, which served to harvest water, rainwater, from the temple platform into a massive cistern. Its twin, uh, which you can see here, this massive cistern, uh, its twin barrel vaults supported by reused inverted columns, and this was built in the late third century. After the Church of Theodore was built across the street in the fifth century, water provisions changed again. These remarkable photographs taken by Fisher in 1929 show the proliferation of water channels that issued from the Artemis temp Temple platform into the street west of the church. Uh, you can see a series here of column drums. This might look like a big pipe, but it's actually column drums that have been channelized on top so as to carry water uh, into the large vaulted reservoir, which is just to the left of this photo. Uh, but you can also see another open channel uh, that may have been a pipe conduit that served to drain water into another uh, Roman uh, ossuary or sarcophagus that in turn uh, actually had... Uh, uh, fed water into uh, a large cistern uh, that is found in the atrium of the St. Theodore Church. So we could use some basic math uh, to give quantitative impressions of how much water could have been collected as runoff from ground surfaces or the rooftops, the showing uh, the different scenarios for the collection of rainwater from the Artemis Temple platform, um, or to understand the degree to which new cisterns, all of these new cisterns, contributed to the larger municipal water supply of Jerash, but suffice it to say that the quality of these changes that were made to the water system of Jerash in late antiquity are interesting because they evince changes in larger patterns of who had access to water and what, what were the acceptable applications of water for display and for industry, and also what was considered acceptable or sufficient for drinking water, that most fundamental compound, the best of all things. Thank you. Um, I will change the focus a little bit to a project that's still in development, so I don't have as many OSU results as I have Jordan has just shown us. Um, I would already like to express my gratitude to my program, Arts and Archaeology and Mediterranean World, to the Cult Society, and to the University Museum for already providing me with generous support in developing this project. Um, ancient Near Eastern Studies has a very strong bias towards specific geographical zones, which are still considered to be centers of civilization, which are in turn ranked hierarchically, either consciously or unconsciously. Mesopotamia, and especially southern Mesopotamia and Assyria, are accredited a pivotal role in cultural development. Secondarily, Iran is described as a, as a distinct cultural region in constant interaction with Mesopotamia. Geographical regions outside of these distinct zones, between all the red dots you see on the screen, are usually described as peripheral at best, while the, while the people and societies which inhabited these regions are defined purely in relation to the perceived centers, centers of culture. Especially the zone of the Zagros Mountains and the Piemont region between the Tigris River and the Zagros Mountains um, are considered to be between the cultures. 
serving as a corridor route which routes of trade and communication through which routes of trade and communication pass, but which are otherwise merely sparsely inhabited by people who live in awe of Mesopotamian civilization or attempt to escape the suffocating demands imposed by mighty empires. This borderland between Mesopotamia and Iran is often treated as a no man's land, a buffer zone where war wars were fought, military borders were set up even to this day, caravans passed through, and raiding bands tried to make a living. In part, this perception is the result of a serious lack of archaeological research in these regions. During, during our first encounters in, at university or in general books written in recent archaeology, we are shown maps showing the distribution of sites which cluster in well understood and studied geographical zones. The stretch of terra incognita between Mesopotamia and Iran, as you see on this map, usually contains only very few unfamiliar sites at best, immediately invoking and ingraining the idea that this region was largely uninhabited and at the very least unimportant. For the past six years, starting with an in-depth study of one small area within this borderland, the Hamlin region, which is this little blue spot, um, I have become increasingly interested in this region. By gathering the limited information available from sp small spots scattered throughout the entire region, hints of a different picture are surfacing. surfacing. What emerges is, emerges is a unique and varied landscape full of micro-regional variation and vital societies on their own historical track, highly adapted to this landscape and competing with their neighbors and engaging with inter-regional networks on their own terms. The past few years have witnessed a remarkable stability and prosperity in the autonomous region of Iraqi Kurdistan, which encompasses a significant part of the zone between Mesopotamia and Iran. As a result, after many years of absence, the first archaeological team started to return to Iraq and seize the possibilities offered by the stability in Iraqi Kurdistan. During the past year, we even witnessed a true explosion of archaeological fieldwork, resulting in almost full coverage of Iraqi Kurdistan by several large survey projects. Considering my research interests in this region, I decided to reach out in an attempt to contribute to this new wave of fieldwork. Following a short exchange of emails with the director in Sulemania province, I, d um, I visited Sulemani province in March together with my colleague Andre Tome from the University of Coimbra in Portugal where we met with the local director of antiquities, Dr. Kamal Rashid Rahim, and the director of the Sulemani Museum, Dr. Hashim Hama Abdullah, and to explore options for setting up a fieldwork in this region. Thanks to their incredibly generous hospitality and assistance, we were able to visit several sites in the region and to explore the impressive landscape. After some hesitation, and probably while being annoyed that we weren't settling on excavating on one of the sites that we have seen, had seen all day wrong, long driving around in this landscape, um, our, the, the representative who accompanied us, his name was Saber, um, he, he was a little bit annoyed that we were still pushing him trying to see more sites, and he sighed and he finally decided to take us to a small area behind the hills that we had been seeing southwest of us all day long, to a site called Kanichaya. Crossing the Karadang Hill, yeah, the Karadang Hills you see down there, we came upon a small valley enclosed by these hills on one side and a range of mountains on the other side, the Bazian Range. The Bazian Range can only be crossed through very few passes. Several of these passes contain reliefs carved into the facade of the mountains depicting deities and kings. The most famous of the, these reliefs is the Darbandi Gar relief. Obviously, the idea of researching a stretch of land along important passes, connecting Assyria with the Sharizar Plain and the Zagros Mountains, immediately appealed to us. After careful deliberation and evaluation of the material we had collected and the sites we had visited, and some necessary feasibility studies, of course, we decided to apply for a permit to set up a project centered on the site of Kanichai. Considering that we are still at a very early stage in our career, the intention from the beginning was to set up a relatively small scale project with specific research questions. While we cannot muster the resources for a large scale undertaking covering large areas or exploring large sites as many of the projects right now are doing, we are convinced that a well-directed and planned project can yield important and detailed results which can complement other research operating on a much larger scale. Kani Chai is ideally suited for our aims. The site is small, between 1.5 and 2 hectares, but it is high and contains a long sequence of occupation, 
spanning thousands of years. Based on the shirts collected from the site during our short visit, we identified occupations starting in the fourth and fifth and fourth millennium BC during the so-called Ubaid and Uruk periods. Um, the majority of the material collected ca can, however, most likely be dated to the entire range of the Bronze Age, while there also appears to have been occupation during the Hellenistic and Parchan period, which is very poorly understood in the region, and going into the early Islamic era. As a result of the lack of archaeological fieldwork in the region, the local material culture is very poorly understood, making it difficult to date and evaluate ceramic material rec recovered from sites in the region. Establishing a typology and sequence of changes in material culture will be crucial to the success of the coming years of archaeological research in Iraq and Kurdistan. This can only be achieved if stratigraphic sequences spanning long periods of time are exposed at several sites, which can be used for relative dating, and if sufficient C14 samples are collected in association with stratigraphic sequences to establish the absolute date. Given the small size of Kani Chaya, allowing significant results in a relatively short period of time and the long history of occupation at the site, we will be able to retrieve a stratigraphic sequence which can be used for evaluating the material culture at sites in the region. Even though the site is relatively small, Kanichai stands out in the area. And you can see it, if you can see it, yeah, over here, I'm not gonna be able to zoom in more. So as you can see, I mean, it's located in the center of a small plain part of the Bazian Basin, where several springs and small streams converge. And as you can see, yeah. It is also located close to the conjunction, conjunction of the roads coming from two important passes crossing the formidable Bazian mountain ranges. Considering its central location, it seems reasonable to assume that Kani Chai was a small local center controlling or administering the plain between the Bazian ranges and the Karadang Hills on one of the main routes of communication connecting northern Mesopotamia and the Zagros Mountains. While excavations at the site will give us information about the role and nature of this site in this region, we also intend to conduct intensive survey in the area between the two main passes, the Bazion Pass to the north and the Basra Pass to the south. In combination with the stratigraphic sequence we can establish at Kani Chaya, we intend to reconstruct the history of settlement in the region. The core area of our project is a relatively small region, clearly demar demarcated by geographical features on one important route of communication. A relatively small scale project can map out this region and evaluate the local developments throughout history, as well as its wider significance within the interregional framework. We have set up this project as a cooperation, if you can see it on the map again, and you can see the, the Bazian Range and the Karadang Hills, and so this area is where we wanna focus our survey on and then maybe include as well more extensive survey along the entire Bazian range for all the passes and to document the reliefs as well. So we have set up this project as a cooperation between myself, Andre Tome, and Ricardo Cabral uh, from the University of um, Coimbra with, with the support of our respective institutions, the University of Pennsylvania and the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at, um, here in the, at, the, at the University of Pennsylvania. In addition, we are co um, collaborating with Blashat Marv, currently finishing his PhD at Leiden University, and Kozat Ahmed, who is a, re who's a recent PhD from Leiden University and is currently setting up the archaeological de department at the University of Slimania, both of whom have been involved with the archaeology of the Iraqi Kurdistan for many years. If all continues to go well, our first full season of field work will take place in August, September next year, and then hopefully I can provide more actual results from this really fascinating site. Thank you for your time. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really exciting for me to be here as a first year uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the Department of Anthropology. My report from the field is gonna be a little bit different, I guess, um, because I don't have a report from the dissertation field, for instance, yet, and I am actually currently trying to decide if I'm gonna continue to work in Australia, which is where I did my master's research. But what I'm gonna talk to you today 
about um, is that research and kind of the, the different side um, that I was trying to, to approach of um, archaeology's role in the sociopolitics in uh, Western Australia and Australia uh, more broadly. So uh, the goal of this project, um, when I was thinking about it, was to address the ways in which archaeology, as a distinct mode of heritage practice, uh, has been implicated in the broader national discourses surrounding reconciliation in Australia between indigenous Australians and the descendants of settler Australians. Um, it is perhaps one of the hottest topics in domestic, on the domestic agenda in Australia. And when I was there, it was pretty much impossible to pick up a newspaper without one, two, three you know, articles dealing with the topic. So it's a very salient topic. And um, one of the, the very uh, important issues that has been brought up is the role that anthropological and archaeological research has played in the relationship between indigenous uh, and settler Australians throughout the past two centuries. So this research also grew out of my interest then in dealing with these difficult aspects of heritage, uh, what Lynn Meskell has called negative heritages um, that are, are really gross out of, of conflict. And also in trying to put people, as in present living people, back into the research that we're doing in archaeology, how does that affect, how does our research affect what's going on in present day? So I'd like you to meet my mentor here. Um, I met Mardu, who is the community that I was working most closely with in Western Australia uh, in 2009 when I participated in an overseas seminar that was supposed to focus on issues in Indigenous Australia broadly. Uh, so I got to know a lot of the very complicated sociopolitical issues that had been going on there, and one of them surrounded native title. And so native title is an issue of uh, reappropriating lands and rights to land use uh, by indigenous communities from the Australian state and uh, and Commonwealth governments. And what had happened was, oh, excuse me. What had happened was that this area here, that's outlined in green, um, was contested for by members of the Mardu community and was won. So that green area there is the. Um, Mardu determined native title land tract. And this was a very, very big victory, uh, and it was the first uh, native title land tract of its size to be re-appropriated re, um, by an indigenous community. So Mardu are the people whose traditional estates are located in this entire region um, of Western Australia, which is known as the Western De Desert and Pilbara regions. And um, they now, as I mentioned, have this 130,000 kilometer square tract of land um, in within which are the three primary communities that I was working in, Hunmu, Whangor, and Kunawarichi. And uh, these were extremely important for my field work and I spent about 14 weeks total there um, working with members of the community. So, in those communities, there are about 2,500 Mardu, um, but they also reside throughout other places uh, in Western Australia, the Northern Territories, and Southern Australia in places uh, like Perth, uh, Broome, Fitzroy Crossing, Waluna, these very big hubs in the area. And as a name that actually grew out of colonial encounters, Mardu is actually an appropriated name that just translates loosely into one of us. So it was, um, excuse me. So as a name that grew out of this, the relationships that we see in the Western Desert right now are very influenced by colonial encounters. Um, but what it also means is that there are several very complex and diverse genealogical links running throughout this entire region. And that affects what we can see archeologically there as well. So Mardu have been identified as one of the 
last Aboriginal peoples to undergo sustained relationships with settler Australians, um, many of them deciding to remain quote unquote out bush until the late 1960s and early 1970s when prolonged droughts, cattle droving enterprises, uh, rapidly declining populations, kin obligations and government initiated missile testing among other uh, issues drove the last remaining nomadic families out of the desert. And um, Mardu first came into contact with Europeans somewhere around the late 1890s and had been gradually moving out of the desert into mission systems or onto pastoral um, lands up until that point. But that was kind of the last flushing out of the desert by the Australian government. And eventually in the 1980s, there was a movement to reclaim those lands and to move back out and to um, take up traditional practices again, et cetera. Um, <coughs> so what I decided to focus my work on was the Canning Stock Route, which is this lovely green line here that cuts through the determined ma uh, Mardu native title. And the Canning Stock Route was interesting to me because it was a cattle droving uh, route that went from the north at Hull's Creek to the south at Wamuna. And it was supposed to get cattle and meat and leathers and all these things to the south where they were mining gold. But there was a tick infestation, a really bad one. And so they weren't allowed to put them on the ships and take them around uh, the coast as they normally would do. So they had to think of some smart plan and they decided that they were gonna drove the cattle through the desert. Nobody knew anything about the desert and obviously the desert is very hot. <laughs> so they had been very unexplored by Europeans at that time. And there was a lot of uh, contention about whether or not this plan was gonna work. Well, this man named Alfred Canning, who is probably most famous for his surveying of the rabbit proof fence. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this or seen this, right? So he surveys this 1800 kilometer track through the desert um, and cuts through the traditional estates of Mardu. So the, the, the track itself actually um, traces about 50 sacred sites and water sites for Mardu. Um, currently, beside being a road that Mardu utilized on a, on a regular basis, the Canning Stock Route is most known for being the Outback's most premier four-wheel drive adventure track. So it gets a number of tourists every year and um, I had a really interesting encounter with a Lonely Planet book one day that was talking about the area and uh, the, the only mention of Aboriginal people throughout the entire description is when um, tourists were <laughs> encouraged to go and see Alfred Canning and his men's uh, graffiti tagging of their rock art sites. So it was a very interesting play between the way that the, the landscape is being described as largely devoid of anyone um, and the way Mardu see it as having been their traditional home states. And uh, obviously you can kind of see the tensions that might go on with that kind of a telling of a story. But recently there have been uh, two really important, among others, but two very large scale important heritage projects, one of which is very archeology span heavy, one of which includes archeological work but it's really more focused on contemporary artworks. So I decided that I was gonna take these as my two case studies and look at the ways in which they were framing the story of this area surrounding the Canning Stock Route. So this first project here, Kuju Wankanyura, which translates to One Voice for Country, um, has been an ongoing project, a very large scale ongoing project for about 20, 25 years now, and uh, was developed in conjunction with the Australian National University um, through Drs. Peter Beth and Joe McDonald, who were working closely with Mardu um, in the early uh, 1990s. This project has focused mostly on the protection and recording of archeology span and rock art sites. Its alternative name is the Canning Stock Root uh, Rock Art and Dukurpa Project. Uh, focused on heritage and environmental management in the area. So it's a big amalgamation of everything they could possibly do to make this a heritage area as opposed to just focusing on one site or another. Um, and it incorporates 
to a large degree ethnographic research and the collection of oral histories, as well as these back to country trips where Mardu elders take uh, Mardu youth back out into the desert to important sites and you know, try to teach them about what's going on out there. And a lot of those sites are um, identified archeological sites as well. So there's quite a bit of um, collaboration that happens around this area. The second project that I was fortunate to actually work on the opening for was Yuarakuju. And Yuarakuju, which translates into one road, um, is focusing, obviously, on the road, right? Kiani Stock Route is here, you can see in this picture here, and over here, it runs here. Now what's significant about this project was that as a contemporary collaborative arts initiative uh, that was done over a period of five to six years, it manifested into uh, a project that m <coughs> sought to show how Mardu, through their contemporary artworks, could make effective claims to land and to history in that area, and also be effective mediums for teaching history to others and uh, critically considering this question of reconciliation throughout that area where tensions between indigenous Australians and, um, and white miners and other groups that uh, populate the area now uh, have become very high. What's perhaps the most important thing about this project, however, was that as a contemporary arts project, it was actually housed in a National Museum of History. It was at the National Museum of Australia, which is right across the street from their National Art Museum. Um, but it was a very deliberate move to take a contemporary arts project and move it into a history museum. Um, this is the first instance of Aboriginal art being the main focus of a large scale exhibit in one of the National History Museums in Australia. And part of the reason for that is that this canvas, <laughs> I keep doing that, I'm very bad with these things. Please forgive me. This canvas here, which is called the Nurara canvas, um, was actually used in the northern uh, portion of Western Australia to win another native title um, case. So what you see here is actually a, a detailing created by some of the elders in the community of all of the sites and um, claims to land that they made in this area which they then supported with archeological materials. So this very tense, uh, tense interaction and a complex interaction between what's happening in contemporary movements as well as what's happening uh, throughout the archeological research in the Western Desert. So to conclude, I would say that uh, the reason that I thought that this project was so important was that because of the large scale and community-based participatory structures of it, um, of, the, of the two of them, Yuarakuju and Kujiwankunyura, the levels, the high levels of visibility and the potential to address public questions surrounding Aboriginality and what it means to be Australian in today's world were, were addressed explicitly. Um, <coughs> so as I said, as, as a first year, not really sure what I'm gonna end up doing and if I'll go back to Australia. However, I am positive that the, what I learned there um, will drive the future work that I do and that I'll focus on how we understand archeology's span role in broader sociopolitical frames um, and how it can be used to address greater systematic problems. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Joanne Barron and I'm a seventh year graduate student in the Department of Anthropology here at Penn. Um, uh, this is a presentation of my dissertation work um, for which I have to thank the, uh, the Penn Museum, the Department of Anthropology, uh, the Kolb Foundation, and the Wenner Grant Foundation. So my dissertation focuses on patron deities uh, among the classic period Maya. 
during the Classic period, uh, the Maya world was divided into a number of largely independent city-states. So here I have a map of the Maya area. This is the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico here. And then this is uh, the region of Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. And as you can see, this middle area here has a ton of archaeological sites. And during the, the classic period, or the period which, which I work on, which is about 250 to 900 AD, this world was broken up into all these different sites, but they were never unified politically. So there was never a Mayan empire, but there was a series of, of semi-autonomous uh, city-states. And um, each one of these had its own set of patron gods. Um, some very large city-states managed to accumulate great numbers of patron deities over the course of their existence. This example is from Copan. This is a, a carved bench from that site um, that depicts a number of the site's patron deities as well as some royal ancestors from that site. Um, Patron deity veneration ritual was an important political tool for kings during the classic period, as well as in later periods. Um, I've here included a quote from the Popol Vuh, which is a post-classic document, so it comes from a little later than the period that I work with. But it describes how patron deity veneration ritual uh, gave kings um, authoritative right to tribute and power. Um, so it talks about the the arduous rituals that rulers had to go through, and this was the way that they justified their lordship. So in the end of this quote, they say that these rituals were done for all. Um, so kings did not merely exercise their lordship, they did not merely receive gifts, nor were they merely provided for or sustained, nor did they merely receive food and drink. This was not without purpose. In other words, these, these patron deity rituals were done for the benefit of the whole community, and this gave uh, king's rights to, to tribute and authority. So I wanted to study patron deity veneration at a specific site in the classic period to see if I could really um, tease out the ways that these rituals were used within the political context of one specific, uh, one specific independent polity. So I conducted my fieldwork at the site of La Corona. Here's a map of the site, and it's located in northwestern Guatemala right there. La Corona was an important political player in the late classic period because of its location along a major trade corridor. So here's La Corona here. And this trade corridor linked Calakmul, which was a very powerful and wealthy site. Um, and it linked it with sites further south and especially in the Guatemalan highlands, which have a number of natural resources that were used by the sites in this region. So because of its uh, location along this trade corridor, La Corona was rather wealthy and had a large number of carved monuments compared to other sites of its size. In 2005, a hieroglyphic panel was discovered in structure 13R5. That's this structure here. Um, and this uh, is located, let's see. Uh, the location of this structure is the southernmost in a line of five small temples here. So the hieroglyphic panel uh, was dedicated, it describes how this uh, temple, 13R5, was dedicated to a patron deity in the year 677 by the La Corona king, Kini Chiok. And it also describes how in 658, uh, previously, Kini Chiok's father, Chako Nab Chan, had dedicated three other temples for three other patron gods of La Corona. So from hieroglyphic text, we can get some idea of the political context within which these two dedicatory events happened. So Kini Chiok is here, and he was the son of Chako Nab Chan. And Chako Nab Chan, in turn, was the son of Sak Mas. But Sak Mas had been assassinated in AD 656 by a lord named Kukahau, this guy. Um, in 658, Chako Nab Chan avenged his father's death by assassinating Kukahau and seizing the throne. And the patron deity temple dedications occurred just 35 days after this coup. So, it was surmised that the three temples to the north of 13R5 here uh, corresponded to these three temples that were dedicated by Chako Nab Chan in um, 658. 
So I conducted a series of excavations on these temples to get a sense of the kind of activities that went on in them and their construction history. And what I found was that there were three identifiable uh, construction phases to these temples dating back to the early classic period. So this meant that these temples had previous phases before their dedication as patron deity shrines in 658. Um, in the second phase of structure 13R2, so this blue phase here, um, I excavated what appeared to be a royal or high status tomb, which appears here. Um, and this tomb included a number of grave goods, including numerous freshwater shells, uh, the remains of a crocodile and a turtle, 15 ceramic vessels, a small amount of marine shell, um, and the tomb then was also sealed off with a woven mat, which in uh, my iconography is a symbol of rulership. And the, the mat left an impression here on the ceiling of the tomb, even though the mat itself did not survive. Um, in addition, the tomb was covered with a layer of lithic debitage, which you can see here. Um, and this layer included both uh, chert and obsidian fragments. Um, I estimate that a total of 20 to 30,000 fragments originally covered this tomb, but we were only able to recover about a third of that. Um, such lithic deposits are associated with royal tombs at other Maya sites. So all of these features together really pointed toward the identity of the tomb occupant as being an early classic ruler of La Corona. A similar tomb was also found here in structure 13R4, but its contents were looted. Um, and I also suspect that there was a, a third tomb here in this middle structure, but um, due to looting, that structure was too dangerous to excavate. So if we look again at the phases of construction in this building, um, we can see that we have a large funerary shrine, the blue phase, that was built um, on top of the tomb, probably around the year 600. And this can be compared to the thin layer of architecture, the lighter blue, that corresponds to the 658 rededication of the structure as a patron deity shrine by Chakao Naptan. So it's clear from this archeological evidence that these patron deity shrines originally served as funerary temples, and that Chakao Naptan was in a great hurry to replace them since he did so 35 days after his accession to power. I believe that the reason he did this is because these tombs belong to the ancestors of his rival, Kukahau. So archeological and epigraphic evidence at La Corona suggests that there were two rival families who competed for royal authority at La Corona over the centuries. So Sak Mas, Chako Nabchan, and Kinich Yok belong to one of them here called Lineage A. So we have Sak Mas, Chakonab Chan and Kinich Yok. Well, Kukahau, who I have it here, um, and the ancestors buried in these temple structures here um, belong to what I call lineage B. So thus the coup in 658 was part of a large pattern of conflict at the site. And by replacing the funerary shrines with patron deity shrines, uh, Chakonab Chan sought to remove the ancestral source of legitimacy of the rival family. And by replacing these shrines, he didn't just destroy them, he replaced them with patron deity shrines. And I suspect the reason he did this is the same reason that the Popol Vuh talks about the importance of patron deity veneration, that he was doing so, he was replacing these rival ancestors with a, a cult of patron deities that would um, reinforce his own power within the community. So, uh, work at La Corona continues every year. Uh, in 2012, 22 new inscribed blocks were recovered near the, uh, these temples, including this block. Um, the block depicts Sakma dressed in uh, ball game gear, ready to play with a king of Kalakmul. So new finds allow us to refine our understanding of this classic period city every year. Thank you. Well, thank you. I thank all of the Kolb scholars for a fascinating window into the real diversity of, of research that actually the society is involved with. So I wonder if we can give them another round of applause. For that.
Now, we've, we've gone a little bit over time, but they've really kept to the, the schedule fairly well. And I know a number of you have to go off to your flashlight tours. So I wonder if I can ask some of the Kolb scholars to stay behind at the front here just to answer a few questions for anybody who'd like to ask them now. So thank you all again, and thank you so much for your support for the museum. <laughs>